Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live from Calvary Chapel in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media, visit us online at calvaryaurora.org or download our free app on all platforms. And now, here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Amen. Take your Bibles, open them to the book of Hebrews chapter 2 as we start a new chapter in our study in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2, we're going through verse by verse, allowing God to really minister to our hearts, learning about the supremacy of Jesus. That's the theme. Jesus is better. If you haven't written that down yet, write it down somewhere, maybe over the title of the book of Hebrews in your, in your Bible. Jesus is better. And we spent the last seven Bible studies looking at the introduction to the book of Hebrews and how Jesus is better than the angels. But in reality, we learned that he's better than the prophets. He's better in every single way to everything. As this group of Jewish believers are faced with the crossroads of leaving the substance of their Messiah, their Savior, to go back to the shadows of empty religion. That's really where they are. Unless you think being separated by a few thousand years that the Bible isn't relevant to you. Listen, you are faced with decision after decision after decision in the very same way. Oh, it may not be to go back to some empty religious ritual, but time and time again, you and I are faced with the decision to either steady on and go forward in the things of God, trusting him no matter what comes our way, or going backwards. And that's really the warning that we get in chapter 2. By the way, chapter 2 gives us the first, if you're taking notes, the first of five warnings in the book of Hebrews. Five warnings. The first warning, if you're jotting them down, is here in chapter 2, a warning against drifting. Drifting away from God's word. Then in chapter 3 and and 4, we're going to be warned not to doubt God's word. Chapters 5 and 6 will be warned to not become dull, D-U-L-L, dull toward God's word. Then in chapter 10, we're going to be warned not to despise God's word. And then finally in chapter 12, we'll be warned to not defy God's word. For us today, just in these first few verses, we're going to be reminded not to drift away. And it's a strong warning. And I have to say, it's a good to pause here and be reminded that There are those times when people are struggling and going through things that part of ministry to them will be to warn them. We don't always equate comfort and warning together. You know, we might see somebody struggling with something, somebody wrestling with the flesh, maybe battling to go backwards, and our first response is to come alongside and encourage them, and no, don't do it, it's a bad decision, think of everybody that's going to be heard about, and you take a softer approach, and, and I say, hey, take the soft approach, but don't neglect the warnings of God. There are times when people need to be warned. And sometimes the greatest warning is needed in the greatest time of decision. A time of when someone's just choosing the flesh. Somebody that times that someone's just choosing to disobey God. That's where chapter 2 opens up in verse 1. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away. Now you Bible students, you know that the word therefore automatically brings a question. Because therefore is a connecting word. In the original language, as this was written in the Greek, there is no chapter breaks, no verses, and actually no punctuation in the Greek. So it just reads straight through, constantly straight through. For us, we break things down in chapters and verses, and it's very, very helpful to find things. But if you could just open up and think, okay, there's no chapter break here, so this is all one thought. So go back to chapter 1, verse 14. It says, speaking of angels, we've just spent all this time looking at the supremacy of Jesus over angels. Then he says, are they not just ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation? Therefore, and so we have to ask the question, whenever you see a therefore, you need to ask this question. What is it there for? What's the connection? What is the point that's being made here? Why is it there? Well, chapter 2, verse 1 is closely connected with the superiority of Jesus over the angels, over the prophets, 
over any other message that's come before. Because Jesus is supreme in every way, we must give the more earnest heed to what we've heard. If there's ever a time in the history of the church of Jesus Christ to hear this message, it's now. Now, I thought maybe it was just because I'm getting older and the longer I serve in ministry. I've been ministering in this church now for 18 years, uh, serving in the previous church I came from for seven years. And so I was just thinking, you know, as I'm looking back in the urgency of my own heart and what I'm trying, what, what I believe God wants me to do and to stir you up and to stir those that listen on radio is, is this sense of the culture that we're in and how the church is not making that much of a difference in the culture. The culture seems to be making a far more difference in people's lives than in, in believers' lives than believers are making in the culture. It's, it's like going against the, 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 what is the word I want to use? grain current because i'm thinking of water i'm thinking of that old shirt in the 80s maybe some of you will wear it to appreciation where it's got all the fish there and then there's a christian fish going against the current it's it's an old shirt some of you might bring it to the 80s night go ahead bring it to the 80s night they don't make it anymore but it's going against the culture going against the current of this culture where there is you know as, as you're warned against drifting you don't drift overnight you don't wake up one morning and go, man, look how far I am from the things of God. It takes time. You know, it reminded me of when I was a kid and my parents would take me to the beach and we would go out, we would run straight out, a straight line into the water from the towel and from, from where my parents set up in the beach. And we would go out in the water and we would play. And before you know it, we would look up and find out, man, we're a half a mile down the beach. What happened? The current of the water took us. We weren't paying attention. It wasn't something that we were swimming against the current. We were just playing, enjoying ourselves. And I find that that's happening in the church. And I thought maybe, well, it's just me. I'm getting older. I'm seeing more. I'm watching more people get divorced in this church. I have people sit in my office and go, you know, I don't love them anymore. What are you talking about? Are you a believer? Yeah, I'm a believer, but I'm just going to leave her. What? I mean, I have heard the craziest things in my office that I haven't heard in the previous, I've heard more things in the last five years than I've ha heard more in the previous 13 years of serving. Like in front of me, it's not even something that, that they're, they're saying behind your back. They got a pastor in the room and they're just sharing all this sin and all this, and I'm just giving up. And I'm like, what do you mean you're giving up? Are you a believer? Yeah, I'm a believer. And I just feel like God wants me to divorce. I'm telling you right now, God did not give you that feeling. So you're like, well, I don't think I want to sit in your office. Well, then don't, don't get divorced. Don't think about it. Fight for your marriage. Fight for your kids. Whether it's divorce, whether it, I mean, you know, I, from time to time, I don't do this all the time, but, but kind of regularly, I'll take the bulletin and I'll pray through it. I'll just pray for the different events. I'll pray for the things that are going up. And there's one new announcement that we've been having recently that when I pray, I have two requests to it. Uh, and, and, you know, my heart just sinks. It's the, it's the class, the discipleship class ha we have on pornography. Why do we need that? Well, I'll tell you why we need that. Because even as I'm speaking right now, the Holy Spirit is bringing conviction to the hearts of many in this room that are into pornography. Why are you into pornography? W what is it that you think you're going to get from that? W what is it that, you're gonna, that you think that you're bringing the satisfaction of Jesus Christ into your life by holding your phone or looking to a computer or going to some strip club? Seriously. And I'm, this is believers. We're talking to people that say they love Jesus Christ, that say they're born again, that say they want to raise their kids in the ways of the Lord, that say they, they sit in church and they read, they have a Bible, and, they, and, and we're like, why? Why do we need that class? Well, we need it because right now we have one for men to remind you that your sufficiency is in Jesus Christ. And this is a nefarious, wicked destructive sin that will not end on your own. It, you, it, won't, it won't end. It's going to lead to all, utter disaster. And then the re other request that I have, I have two requests. One is, first I have that feeling. Then I have, man, Lord, one day it would be nice not to need that class. That's not realistic, but it's still a heart cry of mine. And two, you know, we need one for women because this, this, the statistics say that women are involved in this junk just as much as men. The numbers are pretty close. And so how can a church affect the world when divorce rates are so high, 
Pornography's through the roof. Christians are stealing. They're lying. And I don't just mean the normal stumbles of everyday life. I mean lifestyle involved in all kinds of perversity and sexual sin and believers. And I thought it was just me. But the more I read the saints of old, the more I read guys like A.W. Tozer, Ravenhill, and these names not be, may not be familiar, but they were the, the voices of their generation. I, I even think of reading Spurgeon. Because, you know, sometimes as a pastor, you sit down and you think, man, this is the hardest generation to ever pastor because previous generations didn't have phones, didn't have internet. Didn't, I mean, you feel like it, but, but every generation dealt with the same exact sin. The difference in our day is the delivery method, but the sin's the same. It hasn't changed. The devil hasn't invented new sin. He's just invented new ways to participate in old sin. And what is the sin that we participate in the most? The root of everything is believing the lie. Believing the lie that this will satisfy you. Believing the lie that this is more important. Believing the lie that this is what you need. Believing the lie that Jesus is not supreme or not sufficient. And I found, I'm coming to find out that it's not me and me getting older. It is what the church has dealt with from the very beginning. What was one of the biggest problems that the early church dealt with in the book of Acts? Stealing and lying. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? Stealing and lying in the church before everyone. And so what does Paul write? He says, don't drift away. You need to take more earnest heed to what you hear. And that's the problem, isn't it? We don't have a problem hearing. Most of you have still connected with me. Some of you might be mad at me, but that's your problem, not my problem. Because you come to church, I don't want to hear about my sin. Well, what do you want to hear about? Do you want to hear things are going to be just okay? That you can continue on in that kind of lifestyle and that things are going to be fine? They're not going to be fine. I underestimated just how painful it is to watch people live in sin. I mean, just me as a pastor. You know, teaching the Bible is actually the easier part of ministry. It's after 45 minutes pass and we fight. Most of, the, most of my time is spent begging Christians to do the right thing. But literally begging Christians to sacrifice themselves on the altar to do what Jesus said. To do what Jesus said, to deny ourselves, take up the cross and follow him. Most of our time is spent. It's, it's done a diff- lot of different ways. But most of our time is spent begging people like the author is here. We need to give the more earnest heed. We don't have a problem hearing the Bible. We have more mechanisms to receive the Bible today than any other generation. Podcasts, apps, the internet, YouTube, Vimeo, on a website, oh, on and on. We can, have, we can listen to the premier best teaching pastors of all time. It's not a matter of hearing the word of God. It's a matter of doing it. Because there's such an attack on the supremacy of Jesus Christ in our lives, because he's greater than every voice, because he's greater than the angels, because he's the creator of the universe, because he's the sustainer of your life, because he's forgiven you of your sins, because he loves you and cares for you, therefore, we must give the more earnest heed so that we don't drift away. Now, the word drift literally speaks of sliding away almost imperceptibly. And we don't use the word drift very much. We'll use a different word. Let me give it to you. You can circle the word drift in verse 1, and you could write next to it, backslide. Now, I know there's all kinds of people who want to argue whether a Christian can backslide or not. Listen, hang around Christians long enough, and you will find out they backslide. And the idea of backsliding is just exactly what it sounds like. You just begin to slide backwards. You begin to move backwards and not forward in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Nobody, nobody expects to backslide. There, there, isn't, there aren't people that, that will come up and respond to the gospel and say, you know what, I, I love Jesus Christ, and, and I'm just so excited that he's going to change my life, and I'm going to do this thing for about six months, and then six months I'm going to go back into the world and do worse things than I did before I came to the altar. Nobody says that. I haven't, at least I haven't met anybody that said that. 
Nobody thinks that. It's such an exciting time. It's so wonderful to know that your sins are forgiven, that God has a plan and purpose for your life, that he can rescue you. He can rescue your marriage. He can rescue your kids, that he can strengthen you and help you and give you guidance and direction. He promises you eternal life. That's so beautiful, and yet no one plans to backslide. Nobody ever really thinks they're going to backslide because following Jesus is so exciting and so wonderful in our lives. We all want to grow. That's why you woke up early this morning. Your heart's desire is to grow in the things of God. Your heart's desire is to know God personally. Almost always there's that attitude, let's go, let's grow. But real life is not like that. Because real life has hardship and difficulties. Real life has temptations. Real life has lies thrown at us and accusations. Real life has weirdness and spiritual warfare. We all have seasons of difficulty. We all have seasons of discouragement, resistance. We have, quite, we have seasons of doubting and questioning God and wondering what my purpose in life is and where am I going and what am I doing? And those are all the seeds of backsliding. It's a Christian word. I found it at least 20 times in the Old Testament. For example, in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 14, it says, the backslider in heart will be filled with his own ways. Isn't that the truth? Jot that down, Proverbs 14, 14. The backslider in heart will be filled with his own ways, but a good man will be satisfied from above. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 22, to the nation of Israel, return you backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings, Indeed, we do come to you, for you, the Lord, our God. The Hebrew word means to turn away, and to turn back. And here we have a description of backsliding with the word drifting. We need to take the more earnest heed to what we hear. We need to match what we've heard with obedience. I've even noticed in my own life that there were times in my life where I was, uh, times in my life prior where I was quicker to obey than I have been in recent times, where I had a habit in my life where if there's a scripture there, man, I'm going to do that. This is God's word to me. And then over time, you know, you get to know the Bible a little bit. You look up a little Greek word here, and you heard a Bible study there. And now I'm a connoisseur of sermons instead of an obedient child of God. That's our culture. So that now we come into a Bible study like this, we come into a Bible study and you go, you know, you know, what do you think of the message today, honey? We well, you know I've heard better. And now we're critics of the Bible instead of recipient, obedient children of God. And now we're critics of everything. Yeah, you know, I could have liked this and I should have liked that. And before you know it, you walk out and again, the steps of backsliding are right on our heels. It's not how good of a Bible study it was. It's, did you act on what you heard? So actually, everything gets flipped around, isn't it? That's, we don't like the, the spotlight on us. Nobody likes the spotlight on us. So the spotlight on us is simply this. God says, you heard what I said? Did you do it? And you go, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can't see. The lights are too bright. I can't see. Wait a minute, wait a minute. That person didn't say hi to me. Why don't you deal with them? Teach them how to say hi. That's an unfriendly church. That's an unfriendly believer. That's a... What? Therefore, we must take the more earnest heed to what we hear. And the thing that you've heard the most today is, be careful that you don't drift away. Now, I realize in a context of a Bible study like this, this is probably a Bible study that's going outside of these walls, right? Because they're not here. They're drifting away. They're not interested. They're so far from God that they're not even interested in Bible study anymore. That, that the golf course, you know, the weather's changing, so golf got their attention. Or, you know, the weather's changing. Let's go up to the mountains and let's, let's make sure that we live life with the weather changes. And now they're not even hungry for the things of God anymore. I realize that much of this is for those out there, but all of it's for us in here. <laughs> You're like, yeah, you know, so-and-so's not here this week. I know, but you are. So what you hear, do it. Because you can drift away too. And I can drift away. We're tempted to do that all the time. Oh, it may not be going back to Judaism, although many people are tempted to replace rituals and law with the simplicity of Jesus Christ, even to this day. 
where there's a misinterpretation of the Bible, where we need to have a mixture, or even Jesus is, is important, but it's more important that we follow the law. But Jesus said that we're just to love the Lord God with all our heart, soul, and mind. Love our neighbors ourselves. That's the fulfillment of the law. He's our rest. And life is, in Christ is a progression. Those of you that like to run away from things, that's a form of backsliding. Instead of just handling the difficulty that's in front of you and working through it, you choose the route of backsliding. Why would God bring a challenge into your life? Why would he bring challenging situations so that you and I would learn how to die to our flesh? So that we would learn how to grow in his grace and knowledge, not run away. Haven't you learned yet that every time you run away, when you finally get where you think you're going, guess who's there when you get there? You. And the people that you think you're running away from, they're there too. They just have different names because people are people, and you can't run away from God. You go, Ed, no, I'm doing a good job running away from God. Well, ask Jonah. God prepared a great fish for Jonah. What has he prepared for you? Because even as you seek to run away from God, the Bible says, where can I go from your spirit, O Lord? I can go up, I can go down, and there's nowhere I can go to get away from you. You'd never be able to really understand that psalm unless you've tried to run away in your life. Nobody expects to backslide. The problem of backsliding is that you're not where you once were. And not in a positive way. You know, the Christian life is a progress. The most popular word the Bible uses to describe your relationship with God in action is the word walk. We describe, the Christ, we, we describe our relationship with God as our walk with the Lord. And it's a great picture, isn't it? You're just walking along, progressing. You don't walk backwards. At least you don't walk backwards for very long. And then you go from walking to another illustration in the Bible to what? Running. The idea of running a race. Where you're not only just moving forward, but you're moving forward with speed, with a goal in mind. That's the progress of the Christian faith. Backsliding is the exact opposite of God's desire for your life and mine. He's not wanting us to go backwards, but go forward. That's why we need to take practical precautions. And the number one thing that will keep you and me from backsliding is doing what you hear. That's what James said. James said that faith without works is dead. It's lifeless. Anyone can depart from the faith and backslide. I don't care how long you've been a Christian. I don't care how many Bible verses you've memorized, how many times you've read through the Bible. It doesn't matter how many songs you know. It doesn't matter how long you've been a pastor or a Sunday school teacher. It doesn't matter. None of those things matter. Any of us can backslide and commit atrocious, horrific sin apart from God. Anyone can fall away. And so what does he say in verse 1? We must we must give the more earnest heed, or another translation, the most careful attention to the things that we've heard, lest we drift away. Verse 2, for if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, it did, he, if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, it did, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and the gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. When we come to the new covenant, this whole section can be described by the principle of sowing and reaping. Remember Paul was writing to the churches in the Galatia region in Galatians chapter 5 and he talked about sowing to the Spirit and sowing to the flesh. He used the illustration of, of a farm and planting seeds or a garden. That whatever seed you've planted, you're expecting that seed to grow up into what it is. If it was a watermelon seed that you're growing watermelon, you're expecting a watermelon to come out. If it was an apple seed, you're expecting an apple tree to grow. If it was, uh, you know, cucumbers, you're expecting cucumbers. Nobody in their right mind plants a cucumber seed and gets upset when watermelon, and when watermelon doesn't grow. 
I mean, if you know anybody like that, would you send them my email? I'd like to know, what are they thinking? Nobody thinks like that. Nobody thinks that, you know, if I, if I plant a, an apple seed, that an orange tree is going to grow. Nobody thinks like that, that I've met. However, however, I've met hundreds, thousands of Christians, I don't know how many, that think that they can sow into the flesh and not reap the flesh. I've seen it time and time again where they're convinced that what they're doing right now that is clearly against God's Word, not against church doctrine, not against church opinion, not against what a pastor said, but the very simplicity of what the Bible says, and you read what the Bible says, and you don't do it, and you don't think it's going to come back to bite you. I don't understand. You don't think that way in your garden. You, you don't think that way in other areas of your life, but when it comes to the things of God, there's an exception. But there's not an exception. The Bible says if you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption. The wages of sin is always and will always be death. That is an unchanging spiritual principle. But there's another side to this, and that is if you sow to the Spirit, you'll reap everlasting life. And I was just thinking this week how how much the Holy Spirit wants to work among us, but we quench the Holy Spirit by making simple fleshly decisions. And then when they the corruption comes into our lives and we reap the difficulties and we reap the consequences, we reap the issues, we reap all the things that we've been sowing forever, we're shocked and surprised by it. And we begin to drift away. Because you know what happens then? People begin to blame God. They begin to be upset with God. Who warned us? He's the one that said, if you go down this path, this is what you're going to get. And if you go down this path, this is what you're going to get. You know, because the opposite is true. When you sow to the Spirit, you're going to reap everlasting life. It's it's been an area of my life that I want to continue to increase where I'm just sowing seeds of encouragement, sowing seeds of love and joy, and and just saying something nice, encouraging people, just knowing that that's 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 going to reap a harvest of encouragement and love and joy in someone's life. You don't know when it's going to happen. That God wants to make us patient, waiting for him to work. Instead of holding each other to these standards that, listen, listen, the issue in our lives is not with one another, it's with our relationship with God. If all these things, he says, every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, and it did, and it does, how will we escape if we choose to neglect so great a salvation? And the answer is, we won't. We won't escape. If we sow to the flesh, we'll reap corruption. And it may happen at the worst time in your life, unexpectedly. And you won't be the person that you were because you've backslidden away from God. It's not God's heart for you to backslide. It's not his desire for you to walk away from him, to just float by passively away from the truth. William Barclay, a commentator on this section, he wrote something that I just want to quote him verbatim. Let me quote. For most of us, the threat of life is not so much that we should plunge into disaster, but that we should drift into sin. There are few people who deliberately and in a moment turn their backs on God. There are many who day by day drift farther and farther away from him. There are not many who in one moment of time commit some disastrous sin. There are many, though, who bit by bit almost imperceptibly involve themselves in some situation and suddenly awake to find that they have ruined life for themselves and broken someone else's heart. We would do well to be continually on the alert against the peril of the drifting life, end quote. But listen, this is how he describes it. He says, there are many who bit by bit and almost imperceptibly involve themselves in some situation and suddenly awake to find that they have ruined life for themselves and broken someone else's heart. That drifting away is a heartbreaker. 
And not only is God warning us, but he says in verse 4, he says that God bears witness. There's a witness to these truths. Number one, God himself bore witness. And number two, notice, God gave signs and wonders and various miracles and the gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. The supernatural work of the Holy Spirit is among us. He's ready to walk. He's ready to speak and ready to encourage and ready to help. He's ready at any time in any moment. I mean, I'm thankful that in the early church, they were so intense on seeking God's will that they experienced the things of the Spirit. They experienced them firsthand. God speaking, God moving, God healing. And so the question is, why don't we see more of that today? Well, let me give you a couple, couple things, a couple reasons why I think we don't see more of this miraculous work of the Holy Spirit today actively in our Western culture. Number one, unbelief. Unbelief. People just don't believe that God works that way anymore. Somewhere along the way they were taught that. Somewhere along the way they read some book, some theology. No, no, no. God doesn't work that way anymore. He only did that in the book of Acts, and he doesn't heal anymore, and he doesn't do miraculous things anymore, and he doesn't change life, and he just doesn't do it like that anymore. He doesn't speak through people anymore. And, and the prevailing doctrine that's among us today is, hey, we don't need all the signs and wonders because we have the Bible. No, no, no. God hasn't changed. Signs and wonders are a part of God's nature. He, he uses them to get people's attention. Why? So that they might be attentive to the preaching of the gospel. That he might approve and, and bear witness to the work of God in our midst. And, and, you know, we have these afterglows. I mentioned in the bulletin today. We have these afterglows where we come together expecting God to move. And he does. If you come up here today and ask for healing, ask for us to pray, and we pray over you for God to heal you, you know what? We believe that God can heal you. We believe that. We believe that God still heals today. We believe that God can defy the doctor's orders. We believe that God can defy whatever a doctor typed, whatever he wrote, whatever message he left. We believe that God can heal today. And we believe that he is Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. He can heal your broken heart. He can heal your broken body. He can heal your broken emotions. He can bring back what is broken and bring it healed. And he is sovereign in his healing. So we learn to trust him but we don't come up and just do something like out of ritual here. Oh, okay, the Bible says we should pray. No, if we, we believe many times, you know, whenever you're sick and you ask for healing, you know, you want the person to have more faith than you do. (laughs) It's like, man, because you're all, you're getting all the news and you're getting all the difficulty and you're reading all the reports and, and, and man, you, you want somebody that believes God to pray with you. The, The prayer of a righteous man availeth much, the Bible says. We want to believe. And yet, what do we come to? We do so often. We say, Lord, help our unbelief. But I believe God can heal. And and even if he chooses not to heal in the way that we expect, when we leave this body and we enter into the presence of the Lord, we are going to be perfectly healed. All of it will be done away with. That may not be our desire. That's why we respond in grief and mourning at the loss of a loved one. Because we miss out on so much of life that we wanted to share But for those that have gone before us into the presence of God, they're not grieving and mourning. They're rejoicing. They are experiencing what you and I will experience soon enough. Because all of us are going to face that last breath. But we believe God works still today. We don't need an afterglow. We don't need a believer's meeting. But I'm so grateful for them because there's a sense of a small group of people that come way more expected for God to move than in a larger group. But one day, my prayer for our afterglow is that our services are all just this constant, continual gathering of expectation for God to move and God to speak, not just going to church, not just going through and doing what we think we need to do, not just showing up for an hour or so and enduring a message, but rather coming together with the saints, expectant, hopeful, ready, open, so that God might bear witness in any way that he desires. If we're not living life on that plane, on that level, we're missing out. We're missing out on the presence of God. We, we so often live without the consciousness of God. And he wants to do so much more than we want him to do sometimes. Why do we see less and less or hear of less and less signs and wonders in our Western culture? Number one, unbelief. Number two, rationalization. 
rationalization. You go, Ed, what do you mean? Well, you know, we tend to rationalize things. We live in such a scientific culture that we want everything to be explained to us. And if we have something that's unexplainable, we try to explain it away. And don't accept it. Why? Because you, you talk about how God touched you, how God healed you. You go to work so excited. You won't believe what happened. This, this situation in my body, we prayed, we anointed with oil, and God did this work. And what's the response at work? Are you crazy? You're not one of them, are you? And you're like, one of what? Somebody that believes God, that he's still alive today, that you're dead in your trespass? Go ahead and give that to them. No. <laughs> you know how the conversation's going to go. You're going to be all embarrassed. You're going to feel weird. You go, why did I share it? Now I know, man. And now you do that about four or 500 times in your lifetime, and you don't explain. You, don't, you just explain away. Because aren't we so quick to, please, please, don't let me be the only one, okay? But aren't you so quick to turn to Tylenol than you are to prayer? I know I am. I have a headache, I endure it for a while, and then I go into the kitchen and grab some Advil or whatever's in there, and hoping that will take care of the headache. And you know what it does? It takes care of the headache. And I go on with the day. And I go through another one and I turn to this. You know, maybe I'm lacking knowledge. I'm lacking information. You know what I do? I pull out my phone and say, hey Siri, what's the population of Aurora, Colorado in 2018? And Siri says, where's Aurora? No, it's nice. <laughs> Whatever she does. And I'm just so quick to pull out my phone and Google it. You know, when I get away uh, on this one trip, this, this trip with Marie, you know, we do for our for our anniversary, and I encourage you guys to whatever, you guys that are married, you need some time, just you and your spouse alone. No kids, uh, don't bring the bills with you, uh, don't, you know, and even turn your phone off. And so this is the closest, th almost every year I was able to unplug. This year we had some things taking place here, so I had to check in every couple days. Uh, just check in and then log in, log off, log in, log off. So it wasn't like, but whenever we get away, I find out how dependent I am on Google. You know, when I was growing up, you know who Google was? My dad. <laughs> if we had a question, he, the dude knew almost everything. I don't know how he got all, he just was, he just had all the answers. And then Google came along, and now you can ch Google it and check it out. Even last night, I made a few things. I, I had a few questions, and, and there were people that Googled it right during the message and gave me the answer before we were done. And they got busted. <laughs> because... It, we're, so quick to, we're so quick to ask Google and not the Lord. It's just the facts. They don't need to be all convicted over it and beat up. It's just the facts. It's what's been ingrained in us. We're, we're so quick to ask. You know, you've got this big, difficult situation, and then you go to some other source, and you've trained yourself not to go to the Lord. And so no wonder our lives are empty and without meaning and purpose. No wonder we're so susceptible to now smoking pot because it's legal now and, and drinking a little bit more and, and getting involved, maybe seeing a doctor more than we should and getting this kind of pain pill and the Oxycontin and all the... And now, no wonder we, we want to live in this glazed over experience because we've trained ourselves in our culture to not depend upon a God who's with us all day, every day, who's strong and sufficient on our behalf, who will use every circumstance in our lives to make us more obedient and closer to him, to love him more and to love this world less. But we're on the course of loving this world so much and loving God less, and the warning of Hebrews is, hey, because Jesus is superior and you have a relationship with him, we need to take the more earnest heed to do what we hear. Because the moment you choose not to do what you hear, you're on the road of backsliding. And we just become so rational and so full of unbelief, so full. I know it's a hard thing to hear, but we become so full of ourselves. Why else would you be posting all those opinions on Facebook if you didn't think your opinion was more important than anyone else's? Why don't you try to address everything on Facebook and everything in your life with the Word of God and see if it doesn't change your feed a little bit and it doesn't change your mind? It's like every, it seems like every post is like an invitation for your opinion. It's not. It's an invitation for you to seek the Lord with what you just read and what you just experienced and what you're going through 
Everything in life is trying to pull us away from a sufficient walk with God. And so now I find myself joining the pastors of old, begging their churches to get right with the things of God so that you can experience the abundant life and you can experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit and we can experience a dramatic inroad to our community where people are drunk 24-7 and high and stressed out and you name it because for many of you that's how we used to live, isn't it? That's how I lived before I got saved. Life was so difficult, I didn't want to feel it. And I bought the lie that if I didn't feel it, things would get better. But the problem was, things got worse. Why? Because if you sow to the flesh, believer or unbeliever alike, it's it's a spiritual truth for anyone. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. Things are going to corrupt in your life. Things are going to die in your life. People are going to leave you. Relationships are going to end. You're going to run away and isolate yourself. You're going to say things you never would have thought you'd ever say. And you're going to think things you never thought you would ever think. And the very people that God put into your life to help you, you're going to run away from because you've sown to the flesh. And now you're going to reap the consequences. And the good news is simply this. It's God's heart that you not drift away. And he's empowered you and me as believers with the very presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And it doesn't matter how far you are. So maybe you're here today, and it's not just a message for those that will listen on the radio later, but it's for you. And you're backsliding. You are a backslidden, miserable person right now. Because that's what you could say, backsliding. Drifting, backsliding, and misery, they're all equal. Because you're not experiencing what you thought. This world isn't all that, it is, all that it promised. It's not giving you what you thought. You still go to bed upset. You still go to bed worried, filled with fears and stress. Some of you even have night torments because your life isn't right with God. You can't even sleep now. The one place that you got any kind of rest has been stolen away from you because now the enemy's all up in your mind. And the good news is Jesus said, if that describes you, Jesus gives you an invitation. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. Because Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And Father, we take the warning today of drifting away seriously and ask that you would enable us to make forward progress, and that no matter how far someone's drifted away, they can always come back. They can pick up right where they left off. Like we learned on Wednesday night when the axe head was lost. The first question was, where did you lose it? And isn't that the case? Isn't that the case when... We drift away and leave our first love. You always take us back to where we left it. And would you pour out your spirit on us? I know it was some strong words today. I know strong exhortations. I know that for many of us, you know, it's, it's a warning, but, but things are okay in our walk with you, Lord. They're not as bad as it could be, and we're grateful for that. And I just pray that you would help us in our ministry and service to one another, that we wouldn't give up on each other, that we would learn to be patient, that God, we would, 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 would help each other and not hurt each other, that we would come alongside each other to uh, build one another up in love and good works. And I pray for the backsliders today, God. They never thought they'd be here. They never thought they'd be in this place, but there they are. Would you deliver them from themselves? And enable them to believe the truth, how much you love them and care for them. And there's forgiveness available to them. Those that are addicted to pot or alcohol or what started out as just pain medication, now it's become a serious, um, you know, addiction. 
It's not even what they asked for. But the reality of their life is such where great difficulty is upon them, Lord. Help us to sow to the Spirit, Lord, that we might reap everlasting life. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Aurora. For prayer or a copy of this study, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. Or visit us online at calvaryaurora.org. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.